Oh, yes. Okay. And take, what's that, six? Seven. Take seven. One, two, three. My friends, so someone asked me the other day why our company was called Conceptualist Films. It's really part of a project, part of a sort of larger scale idea to bring together two worlds that exist very far apart. One world is the world of philosophy, and one world is the world of, as it were, the popular culture version of the art world, the arts. So that um, you could say, well, what does uh, one have to do with the other? In fact, aren't they kind of uh, opposite, inimical, mutually exclusive? And, and yes, they, they really sort of are. Let me show you why, and here's what, what, I, what I sort of had put together. Let's consider the world of philosophy just very quickly. So if we imagine the world of philosophy, the world of philosophy includes concerns and questions such as the matter of the existence of things, for example, and whether those things are part of, you know, the reality that we experience. So if those things have a kind of a particular or unique or original essence on the one hand, or if they are in fact something larger, part of a larger idea, a larger abstract category that we could call, let's say, maybe the universal essence of something else. So things like existences, particulars, and universals are the questions, for instance, of philosophy. None of this has any real place in the concerns of popular culture, as far as I can tell. And now we're going to look at popular culture, let's call it the arts. Okay, and then in the arts we have things like the issue of maybe personality, um, by which I also mean character development, right, in fictive works, etc. So we have issues like performance, was that a good performance that was given? We have uh, questions such as narrative, is this a good story, was it well told? And we have issues of, of course, the medium. Was this a good photograph? Was this an appropriate film? Did you like that ballet? Was this a proper dance? Was this a rather good TV show, etc.? So the medium comes into the question of what something actually is. Now, these are very different worlds. One world is really taking the objects that you see in the sort of given reality of what we perceive and another is taking everything else as a kind of given and just putting a, a kind of a maybe commercial and artistic and expressive spin on things. How do these two ever come together? And the way that these actually come together is as follows. Let's say that if we imagine whether you know something exists, the typical argument that a lot of philosophers use is this is a chair. That's what I'm looking at right there is not just a product of my mind. This mutually shared hallucination that we're discussing, this happens to be right in front of me. This in fact is really a chair. If I see this chair, you see this chair, then if we all see this chair, this cannot be the product of my own imagination. And so we're using issues like the actual physical objects of the world to talk about sense perception, for example. And then the question then becomes is there are something like a different kind of chair that participates in the world of the chair. For example, another chair may look like it and may have only, for example, a slightly different maybe hue or uh, a color difference or a slight stylistic difference. Is that, is that a question of it, these two being the same chair? Is there sort of a unity of chairhood here, if you like? And the answer is, of course, yes, there is, right? What's interesting for a lot of people is that when you show a young child a chair and then you show him another chair, eventually you're going to point out something else that looks to be a chair and you're going to say, what is that? And they're going to be a chair, even though they've never seen the object before. So while they have this notion of a particular object and a particular object, there's going to be something else that they're going to look at that may resemble something completely unlike anything they've ever seen. But if for some reason it looks to them like it has the elements of a chair to it, they're going to say, why, you know what, that's a chair too. And so the question becomes, how is it that, for example, 
we can take another particular of something that we never called a chair and we somehow have the notion of chairhood in there. And that's what philosophers look at as being sort of the universal. The idea that uh, perhaps there's some kind of abstract category of chairhood in which all of the particulars of a certain thing fall. And if you have this universal, then you can have other universals. Universals such as the idea of love, right? You can have universals such as the idea of maybe, you know, the death of something. We may never have seen something dead, but once we see it's not moving, we kind of know that there's a sort of deadness to it. So there are a lot of these abstract concepts, including the words words that we use, you know, that's another kind of abstraction. And all these things are very much the interest of philosophy. But philosophy makes all of these available to us through both language and through the, I guess, process or the idea of images. And as a matter of fact, those are the two things that in the arts everyone really also uses in order to push forward their agenda of creative uh, expression. Language is very obviously in things like in films, right? In poetry, we have it in novels and other forms of literature, right? We have it in graffiti. Language is everywhere. But at the same time, we also have not only language, we also have images. And images are much broader in terms of what they can give us. You know, we can talk about love, we can talk about death, we can talk about language, you know. And even in our discussion of language, right, we can uh, put the, the idea of language in some sort of a verbal, uh, I should say, a, an iconic frame. So all of a sudden we have these two very different ideas, you know, of what we ha are getting from the world of art and what we're getting from the world of, as it were, philosophy. These two worlds that never appear to meet, they never seem to sort of discuss anything because they're, one is talking about abstractions and the other is really essentially talking about nothing but very particular things of the moment, things like, you know, what we have in fashion. <clears throat> the idea of sort of a excellent, uh, you know, of beauty behind all these uh, latest trends, you know. Then, uh, all of these images are coming to us through both the world of the popular arts and the world of philosophy. And it is in fact these two very different worlds that do not meet with each other that to me seem interesting enough that we can imagine ways of looking at how one informs the other. For example, what exactly is it about larger scale questions regarding the arts and creative expression that really for us um, make it a unique and different one? You know, what is it about the arts? What is it about poetry? What is it about certain kinds of film that for us really lead to larger questions about who we are? And in turn, you know, for us, what is it that at the same time we can ask are the larger universal issues that really make great film or great poetry, great literature, great street art, great music. So these questions uh, back and forth in this world is exactly the world of a conceptual thinker. And that's kind of why all the work we do is somewhere in this weird line. If we take that line as a, like a little blip in the horizon and we move into it until it expands and gives us what we need, we find that in fact, that is in fact something that expands out and turns into everything that we're interested in. This entire field of endeavor is exactly what we're looking for. That's where we're going. And that's the project. That's the agenda, all of these things together. <laughs>